we might get going. It's five past 12. We've given everyone a good chance to jump in and they can always join us down the track anyway. So hi everyone, a big welcome back and um, thank you for attending the G2Z online event series. Uh, in the spirit of reconciliation, we acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to the elders past and present and extend that respect to, respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. My name is Nell Thompson. I'm the coordinator of the National Getting to Zero program, or as we refer to it, G2Z. I'll be hosting the webinar for you today, but don't blame me if anything goes wrong. It's nothing to do with me at all. Getting to Zero was developed by Animal Welfare League of Queensland, and they continue to support it to this day. G2Z offers its consulting, support and educational services at no charge to local governments and not-for-profits across Australia. Our focus continues to be on companion animal welfare and management issues such as strategy, legislation, operations, programs and community engagement, working towards reducing intake to pounds and shelters and keeping pets in their homes. We invite people to take a look at our website at g2z.org.au sign up for our regular e-news, connect with us via social media and to get in contact with us to see if we can help or to have a chat about the issues that are facing your community or organisation. So to today's session, once I pass over, hand over to our presenters, there'll be around 50 minutes of presentation and around 10 minutes of question time once the presentation has concluded. The recording of the webinar will be accessible via our website to everyone to watch at any time. We're going to ask that everyone mutes themselves during the presentation, unless our presenters indicate otherwise. And if you have any questions, you can start putting them in the Q&A section and we'll get, we will get through as many as we can at the end of the session. If you have very quick questions that relate to your understanding of the content, put your hand up and we'll try to get to you during the presentation. As always, please excuse any working from home background noises that may filter through. We are very grateful to have Professor Peter Irwin and Dr. Bonnie Cumming with us here today. Peter graduated in veterinary science from the Royal Veterinary College, London University in 1982 and has a PhD from James Cook University for studies into canine bab babesiosis in Australia. He's a fellow of the Australian and New Zealand College of Veterinary Scientists in Canine Medicine and has worked in academia in Australia and overseas for more than 25 years as a teacher of companion animal medicine and as a researcher in the fields of veterinary parasitology and medical microbiology. He's an internationally recognised expert in vector-borne diseases and is a director of the Vector and Waterborne Pathogens Research Group, the Cryptic Laboratory at Murdoch University. His research concerns tick-borne tick infections of companion animals, wildlife and humans in Australia, and Peter is currently appointed Emeritus Professor at Murdoch University. Bonnie is a veterinarian and program manager, strategic delivery for animal management in rural and remote Indigenous communities, a national not-for-profit organisation that coordinates veterinary and education programs in rural and remote Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. For the last 13 months, ehrlichiosis has been a big part of Bonnie's role. On behalf of AMRIC and the remote Indigenous communities that they serve, Bonnie's been raising awareness of the impacts of ehrlichiosis to all levels of government, as well as relevant community-based stakeholders. Bonnie's been leading the AMRIC team to develop a range of education resources about this new disease and is actively involved with ongoing government responses to this disease. So over to you, Peter and Bonnie, to tell us all about this scary new uh, thing that's happening with our dogs around the country. Thank you very much, Nell. I hope everybody can hear me. Uh, welcome to the seminar. Um, and my thanks to Nell for her acknowledgement of country. Um, on behalf of Bonnie and I, um, I'd like to specifically acknowledge the Gubby Gubby, uh, the traditional owners of the land upon which I live and work, uh, and the Waka Waka, the traditional owners of the land upon uh, which Bonnie lives and works. And we recognize and thank them and all traditional owners for their continued commitment to caring for our incredibly beautiful country. 
Um, I'll share my screen, uh, but uh, Nell, could you allow me to do that, please? I can't uh, do that just at the moment. Sure, won't be a second. Okay, try this on. That looks good. Oh, the technology. Wonderful. Oh, lovely. Okay, so you can see that, can you? That's perfect. Um, uh, there's still something happening here because that's not quite right. My apologies. I think I was sharing the wrong screen. That is the, that's your view of this, of the presentation. And how about that? It's thinking, it's thinking. No, you, it's still, still on your view. That might be better. Can you see that? No. Oh. Now, whether there's a lag due to internet, anyone else has a different view let me know so what what can you see can you see anything uh, yes apart from my my very good looking self or? yes i can see your very good looking self and i can also see your overview um slide with okay. the the next slide beside it oh okay. it's, yeah it's in presenter view <clears throat> well that should fix that you might have to just stop the share and restart it, Peter. It seems to be stuck. I think it might be frozen. Yeah, I think you're right, Bonnie. Hmm. We practised all this, didn't we? <laughs> it doesn't matter how much you practise things. <laughs> okay. Now. Right. So what can you see? You can see the presenter view. Yep, that's right. And how about that? Yes, perfect. perfect. Well done. Oh, well, sorry about that, everybody. Um, so as I was saying, welcome, welcome to the talk and, and thank you for the introduction, Mel. And yes, this is indeed a very serious disease that we're going to talk about today. Uh, Bonnie and I uh, are going to present slightly different aspects of this. Um, I'm going to talk more about the disease and the cause. So what is canine lichiosis? Um, I'll talk about its diagnosis and treatment um, and spend a bit of time talking about the tick vector and how to prevent a lichiosis because I, I hope that this will be particularly relevant uh, for your organization. Um, and I'll make some comments specific for uh, G to Z to uh, consider and maybe we can discuss them at the end. Bonnie will pick up with uh, giving a more um, overview of the Australian outbreak of ehrlichiosis and how it's unfolding across um, the country. Uh, and we'll talk about its impact on Indigenous communities and the wider uh, implications. So what is canine ehrlichiosis? It's a disease of dogs in the, in the broadest sense of dogs. So domestic dogs, of course, but also wild dogs and probably dingoes. And you know that's that's of uh, importance and interest and concern during the current outbreak here in Australia. The disease is a bacterial infection, and it's caused by Ehrlichia canis, which is a, a rickettsial organism within the group of rickettsia. It's transmitted by ticks, by the brown dog tick, uh, which is uh, present in Australia. And I'll talk much more about that towards the end of my presentation. And once this bacterium gets into the body of the dog, it seeks out the monocytes, so they're one of the white blood cells, and macrophages, so uh, they're cells throughout the body, particular types of cell. Uh, and it lives within those cells, spreads itself around the body, multiplying and causing very significant inflammation. The, the, the dog's immune system recognizes this as a foreign agent, uh, and creates a, a, a very significant systemic 
inflammation. And it's that inflammation that underpins uh, most of the clinical signs that we see. This is a, a serious systemic illness. It's referred to sometimes as canine monocytic ehrlichiosis, which is just a nod to those cells that it infects. And uh, I'll probably call it CME a little bit during this presentation, canine monocytic ehrlichiosis. It's a worldwide disease. It's been recognized in the tropics and subtropics of the world uh, for many years. It was first described um, at the beginning of the 20th century. And it's been recognized to go through three phases in dogs. Now, um, this, this work's been done experimentally many years ago. Um, and to some extent, it's a little bit academic or it's, it's a little bit tricky when we're presented with a dog with a lichiasis to know exactly what phase it's at. But I think it does help you just uh, understand the way the infection progresses within the body of the animal. So there's an acute phase um, after an incubation of just over a week up to three weeks. Um, and at that, si at that stage, the signs are of uh, fever and illness and the dog becomes unwell. And then if the dog is treated, or in some cases, if the, if the immune system gets on top of the infection at that stage, dogs will enter a subclinical phase, which at least according to the literature can be present for many months to years. Now, this is relevant uh, for your organization because dogs can become carriers, if you like, of this infection. They, they can have the Ehrlichia canis in them um, and are always potentially able to transmit it onwards to ticks if ticks bite them into the future. And then there's a very serious terminal phase referred to as a, a chronic or bone marrow failure stage, which occurs in some dogs. Now the clinical experience of CME in Australia is a little bit different uh, and unfortunately much more severe than is reported elsewhere in the world. Bonnie in her presentation will talk about how the disease is unfolding in, in this country. Uh, but what we have noticed um, and the reports that we've had from vets um, and animal health workers all around the top end of Australia is that the disease appears to be really quite severe. Uh, there's very high prevalence in indigenous communities. And in some communities, um, the mortality has been reported amongst sick dogs to be um, upward of 60 to 80% of dogs. We've had reports in some communities of dogs simply dying, um, dead dogs being found. And this has, in many cases, been attributed to ehrlichiosis. It also seems that that bone marrow failure, that last phase, if you like, uh, is, is occurring quite early in the process of the disease. Rather than months to years later, um, it seems to be occurring more quickly. So the picture I'm trying to paint here is, is of a very serious outbreak uh, within Australia. And the question really is, well, what, you know, why is it so severe at the moment? Why is it a little bit different to what is generally recognized and generally reported around the world? Well, first of all, we have a completely naive canine population. The dogs of this country have never been exposed to this bacterium before, so they have absolutely no immunity at all. We also have a very well-established population of ticks in the top end. Um, and sort of linked with that are the ideal climatic conditions in the top end, leading to very high tick densities in certain areas, particularly with, within indigenous communities. And Bonnie will speak uh, more about this. As if you know, all that wasn't bad enough, we have in the top end in particular, we have pre-existing uh, co-infections and comorbidities within the canine population. There's generally higher levels of intestinal parasites, and there are other vector-borne diseases such as anaplasmosis um, and hematropic mycoplasmas and Babesia, of all of which uh, can be 
which are pre-existing and if combined with alikia um, cause more severe disease. This slide shows a list, if you like, of, of the clinical signs, the most, the most common clinical signs that are being reported. So the dogs will be lethargic, they won't want to uh, eat, they will mope around, look miserable, lie around. Uh, they usually have a high fever, so they're pyrexic. Um, and one of the most uh, obvious and, and distressing clinical signs is, is bleeding. They, they bleed uh, particularly from the nose and under the skin. The images there, uh, kindly provided by Dr. John Beadle um, in Broome, you know, show dogs with bleeding noses. That's a, a very common sign of this disease. Um, but uh, the picture at the bottom shows these little hemorrhages, petechial hemorrhages under the skin. This is because the dog's clotting system, the platelets particularly, are not working. Eye disease is common, swelling of the head, um, of the undercarriage, all reported, but together with a wide range of other signs, respiratory and neurological. And as the disease progresses, the, the dogs don't eat well, they become more lethargic, they become emaciated. And as I've already referred to, uh, many of these dogs can die. In terms of the clinical presentation, uh, history of ticks, um, history of tick exposure or the finding of ticks um, on a patient would increase the uh, clinical suspicion of a tick-borne disease, particularly a lichiosis. And of course, any travel history or history of living in the top end of Australia would have to increase the suspicion. Um, and I understand this, the, these latter two points may be very relevant to considerations for uh, G2Z. Here are some more images of, of dogs with ehrlichiosis, um, ocular signs, a wide range of um, signs affecting the eyes are, are reported from conjunctivitis through sort of red eye, which is the bleeding either in the the sclera, the white parts of the eye, or the conjunctiva, or even within the, the uh, eyeball itself, you know, within the anterior chamber, underneath the cornea, there can be bleeding and, and that appears red. But cloudy eyes too, so it's sometimes referred to as white eye, uh, is associated with the immune response in the eye. And the dog, uh, sort of in the middle on the right there, uh, has this puffy face, the edema the swelling. So the clinical signs are quite severe. Um, they're not specific for ehrlichiosis. Other, other conditions will can do many of those clinical signs, can create many of those clinical signs. Um, but you know, in combination with the tick history or with the travel history, then um, that increases our suspicion of this disease. If blood tests are done, and I'm not sure how relevant or how uh, frequent that is for your organization, but if blood tests are done, then these patients are generally anemic to a degree. Uh, severe anemia is not a feature actually of ehrlichiosis until that chronic phase occurs. But because they're bleeding, um, they can become anemic. The anemia might be regenerative or non-regenerative depending on the phase of infection. And the white cell blood the white blood cell count can either be high or low. There's, there's no um, cl uh, clear um, rule about this. Um, sometimes in the early phases with all that inflammation, they have very white, high white blood cell counts. And then later, as the bone marrow disease intervenes, the white blood cell count can be lower. You might read about the intracytoplasmic inclusion. So, you remember I referred earlier to the fact that the bacteria uh, targets cells called monocytes. The image on the right there, the cell is um, a monocyte or two monocytes there and lodged between them, you can see that dark blue, purpley blue mass. That's what's referred to as a morula. Now that's a clump of the bacteria. Um, I took this picture uh, years ago now when I was treating a in, um, in Malaysia. Uh, and 
you will sometimes find, if you look down a microscope at a blood smear, you'll sometimes find these organisms in acute infections, but there aren't many of them. It's a very time consuming practice to look for them. Um, and then once the disease progresses, you won't find them at all. Um, in addition to the changes in the cells, um, very often these dogs have very high globulin levels, um, low albumin, that's a, a, a sign, if you like, or changes associated with inflammation. They become proteinuric. They have elevated C-reactive protein. But there are other nonspecific changes as well. So how do we make a diagnosis? Well, first of all, to remind everybody, this is a notifiable disease. So if vets even suspect they've got a case of ehrlichiosis, that we are obliged to notify state or territory authorities. The diagnosis is made by a combination, as always, a combination of the clinical signs and supportive history. Uh, if you do clinical pathology, consistent abnormalities like the ones I have just referred to. But the disease is confirmed, again using blood tests, and this has to be, at the moment at least, by state or territory veterinary laboratories. And they use a combination of detection of the DNA of the organism, so that's the PCR test, uh, together with serological testing, the immunofluorescent antibody test, much easier to say IFAT, and I've written down here the, the time it takes for those tests to become positive. So you can see for the PCR, the detection of the bacteria in the blood by detecting their DNA occurs quite quickly within four to 10 days after infection, post-infection. But the serological conversion takes quite a bit longer. Um, and so, you know, in early infection, we might expect just a PCR to be positive, but the IFAT uh, not, not positive, but that changes later. Currently, testing is free because this is a notifiable disease. The costs are managed by the state and federal authorities. Um, however, um, tests can be quite slow. There can be quite a slow turnaround time. Um, and during that time, a little bit like with the whole COVID testing uh, situation that we're all in, um, you know, if you have a dog that you're waiting for a, a test that you've sent away, obviously that patient shouldn't move anywhere. Um, you know, you, you need to assume it's positive until proven negative. This slide just gives um, a list of the contact details of the state and territory authorities. Um, as vets, we, as I say, we're, we're obliged to get in touch with our local uh, state vets uh, get their advice and, and follow the um, directions on their website. Now, I do want to just briefly mention in-house tests because I think this will become very relevant to an organisation such as as yours, where you know you'll be having questions about what well, could this dog that I want to rehome or move from A to B could this dog have ehrlichiosis. Now, at the moment, the really the only way of finding that out is to send blood away to the, to the state labs. But overseas, of course, there's a whole load of um, in-house, in-clinic tests that are um, either what are called immunochromatographic, gosh, that's a long word, isn't it? But, but uh, tests like the SNAP kit um, up the top, and some of you uh, are probably familiar with other SNAP tests that are available in Australia made by IDEX, um, or other serological tests. And, and, and overseas, these are readily available, um, just like tests for parvo or tests for leukemia or FIV or, or whatever. But of course, at the moment in Australia, we don't have these tests readily available. You, you, you can get them imported, but they're not commercially available because until now, we haven't had a lichiosis. So um, I think that these tests will become, I'm not sure these tests will become available for us to very quickly get a diagnosis. So these are used in clinic, if you like, um, you know, to give you a diagnosis very quickly. But one of the things 
that has been noticed with the use of these tests in research facilities and my research laboratory for example has been using some of these tests and comparing them against the the results from the state laboratories and they don't agree very well there's what's referred to as a discordance and essentially the in-clinic tests that are all made overseas don't seem to be working very well here in Australia. The reason for this isn't very clear at the moment, but I expect it has something to do with the strain of the alikia that we have here in, in Australia at the moment. But this is something that will need to be addressed if we're going to be successful with in-house testing. So just to wrap up this little bit of uh, my presentation um, and to refer to the sort of diagnostic considerations. Uh, first of all, we, we, we just generally all of us need to increase our clinical suspicion for CME, especially in relocated or travel dogs, or in dogs where you really don't know what their previous history is, where they've been living. You know, and they might have been living in the top end or somewhere where the disease is rapidly becoming endemic. And we also need to keep the clinical suspicion in cases where the clinical signs are consistent with CME, I've referred to what those are, and look for ticks. So how do we manage this disease? There are two approaches. First of all, we need to treat the dogs. So that's what the vets, vets will be doing. Um, and secondly, we need to prevent, break the cycle of transmission, prevent tick transmission and control ticks. So I'll briefly talk about these two aspects now. Without wanting to dwell on this, the, the, the treatment of, of canine ehrlichiosis uh, revolves around the use of doxycycline um, for 28 days. That's the recommended uh, period of time, which in some circumstances is easy to do, but I think Bonnie will probably refer to the fact that this can be very challenging in indigenous communities or remote communities to regularly give it medication every day. And then there's anti-inflammatory treatment and supportive care is indicated. The bone marrow disease itself is carries a guarded prognosis and requires very specific and expensive tailored therapy. Let me now say just a few words about the tick before I finish up. So the, the brown dog tick here in Australia is the vector for Ehrlichia canis. Uh, but I'm afraid to let you know that this tick has changed its name, or at least the scientists that uh, think about these things uh, all the time have decided for, I expect, pretty good reasons that uh, this tick should be called Ripicephalus linea uh, rather than Ripicephalus sanguineus. It's still the same tick, but uh, it's been recognised we have this tropical lineage here in Australia, which is actually the lineage or the type of tick that is really good at transmitting ehrlichiosis. Um, here's its range. The, the, um, maybe if you just look at the uh, dotted, dotted red line um, there, uh, above that line is where the tick is really well established, um, but increasingly there are reports of it further south. Like all ticks, it goes through um, four life cycle stages, eggs, larvae, nymphs, and adults. Um, and it's referred to as a three host tick, which means that it falls off um, the dog between each of these um, life cycle stages. So the larvae feed, they fall off. They might be hanging around for, for quite a few months while they molt, turn into a nymph, nymphs feed, they drop off before molting to adults. The thing about this tick is it's really well adapted, highly adapted to urban dwelling. It's evolved with dogs for a very long time. Um, it's not a bush tick. So we think of things like paralysis tick and you know, most of the other Australian native ticks, well, they're all bush ticks. So dogs might get them you know, when they're out in the bush, paralysis tick being a classic example. But the dog tick, uh, the brown dog tick, is adapted to urban dwellings. It can, it can survive in certain circumstances in the bush, but certainly um, much prefers to live in houses, kennels, shelters. And I guess this is very relevant to you as well. 
So within its enzootic range in Northern Australia, very high tick numbers, they build up quickly and they're difficult to control. But what about outside the range? So, so south of that dotted line in that previous diagram I showed you, ticks will survive in certain conditions. So in heated houses or heated kennels. Um, and so small foci of ticks may become established, but they won't survive in the bush or in parks because it's simply too cold. They, they get too cold or they, they dry out. They, they need the warmer temperature. Uh, however, um, in those uh, situations, it, outside the enzootic range, it does require the presence of infected dogs to maintain the disease in an area because the, the, the ticks do not transmit Alicocanus from the female to the eggs. So you need to have infected dogs. The other, I guess, really critical aspect about this organism and its transmission by the tick is that it is extremely quickly transmitted. So within three hours of the tick attaching, the lichia canis can be transmitted. And that's quite different to most other organisms. Babesia, for example, takes several days before it is transmitted. There's also evidence of male ticks, grazing male ticks, transmitting the infection mechanically. Male ticks run around looking for females and they can hop from one dog to another in search of female ticks. And they just feed just briefly, you know, the female ticks, as I'm sure you all know, get stuck in one place and feed and feed and feed, get bigger and bigger and bigger. But the male ticks um, just graze, take a drink, quick drink of blood here, go looking for a female, quick drink here. Okay. And they can transmit mechanically a lichia in that situation. So this brings us really now to how we prevent this disease. Um, so whatever product we use to prevent ehrlichiosis must kill ticks or repel the ticks before that all important three hour time frame. And just to sort of refresh your memory or, or, or tell you about how tick products for dogs work, there's those that are topically acting on the left there, they, they kill ticks on contact, so the, the ticks don't have to feed, okay? The, the active drug, the, the caricidal drug is in the, in the skin and coat that's topically active, versus, on the right side, systemically acting drugs. So looking at the, 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 the marketplace, the, the market for, for these products here in Australia, anywhere in the world actually, um, there aren't very many that are topically acting, and there are, most of them are systemically acting. And the important thing here is that we do need a topically acting drug, a, a topically acting product to prevent tick attachment and biting to reduce or prevent the transmission of the canes. Whereas the systemically acting acaricides, tick products, whilst very good at killing ticks, they don't kill them quickly enough to prevent the transmission in the bite of a lichicanus. So that's really what this slide says. So the, the, um, the, the systemically acting products, all the asoxazolins, for example, can kill ticks, but, but uh, too, too slowly. Currently, there are only the two topically acting products that are available to prevent individual dogs from getting Ehrlichia canis, um, Seresta and Advantix. And Seresta actually ha now has a registration claim specifically for that. Whereas um, to control ticks in infected dogs and to reduce spread of disease throughout a community, then systemically acting dogs, uh, sorry, systemically acting drugs um, are very effective. In any of the isoxazolins, the, the, the lamas, if you like, uh, and there's a wide range of those. If the infection status is unknown in the patient, then a topically acting product is safest. But again, you, know, you need to assess the risk 
Um, and you know, if if this uh, if you if you're working predominantly in an area where there's paralysis ticks, for example, that don't transmit alikacanes, then the systemically acting drugs will be fine. Okay, so this is my final slide. Um, you, I, I think we we now the world has changed. Gosh, the world's changed for all of us in many ways, hasn't it? But talking about dogs and alikia in Australia. Um, we, we need to consider the potential of ehrlichiosis in any dogs with unknown travel or location history, especially if they're unwell. We need to retain a high clinical suspicion for any dogs coming from Northern Australia. And we need to test, if possible, and I've talked about the difficulties with that, or refrain, I would suggest refrain from moving dogs from the top end to the south. Um, unless we're sure of their status, because that's a sure way otherwise to be spreading disease and to assess the risk of each patient. And tick paralysis, for example, is much more likely a problem along the east coast of Australia and systemically active products are excellent for that sort of pr protection. Look, I've probably gone on a little bit too long. Bonnie is probably fuming, um, but I will stop there. Very happy to take questions or maybe we take them all at the end and I'll stop sharing my screen. Thanks, Peter. I'm still on host disabled, so I think you might have to make me host before we swap over. Okay. Now, you did tell me how to do that earlier, didn't you? Um, could um, you remind me? Yeah, bring up my participant name and then more. And then yes. Yes. Um, Bonnie, I can't find you. Uh, in the panelists. Oh, uh, you're, that's right. You're in the panelists, aren't you? Yes, I'm sorry. There you go. You should. Uh, you have control, as they say, from the flight deck of a jumbo jet. Okay. Now, can I just check which screen I'm sharing? Is it the correct view? That's good. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you, Peter, for that very comprehensive introduction to Elikia. Um, it's, it's so good to have your expertise and knowledge, and I think it has really made a huge difference in the management of Elikiosis in Australia uh, without people with your experience and your expertise, and I think we really would have floundered a lot more than we have. Um, just briefly, I want to just provide a bit of background on AMRIC for those of you who aren't familiar with us. So AMRIC is a national not-for-profit organisation, and we apply a one health, one wellbeing approach to ensuring that remote Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities receive culturally safe veterinary and animal focused education programs. And our vision is there and it is that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities that are healthy and safe for people and their companion animals. Uh, we were founded in um, the late 90s but became formally incorporated in 2003 by a handful of uh, dedicated veterinary and environmental health advocates who had a strong vision for a coordinated and holistic approach to companion animal management in remote communities. AMRIC exists to assist and empower communities to meet their needs for companion animal health, care and safety. And our board and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Advisory Committee work together to guide and govern AMRIC. Uh, we have a small team of staff members and we work with our very many and varied collaborating partners nationally and are so grateful for all of their support um, and the feedback that they are able to provide us. Um, keys to our approach are understanding and respecting people's connection to their animals, working with all stakeholders to co-design and implement culturally appropriate and tailored programs that really meet the needs of the community, and building trust, uh, valuing relationships and advocating best practice with experience and authenticity. Our core areas of work are veterinary services, education and training and advocacy and research. And you can certainly learn more about what we do on our website, the What We Do section. Uh, AMRIC believes that the benefits of access to animal health services and effective animal management programs are many and that they extend far beyond the animal health and management themselves. Um, of course, they do result in improved animal health and welfare, but also improved human health and well-being, enhanced empathy development, community amenity and safety. In remote Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities, we also see enhanced cultural connections. They, of course, result in fewer unwanted animals, reduce negative impacts on wildlife and ecosystems 
and reduced biosecurity risks. Um, however, they don't negate them as we will soon learn with the ehrlichiosis outbreak. So beyond COVID, um, ehrlichiosis has been a major biosecurity story of recent times. So it was first detected in uh, May, well, April really, of 2020. Um, there was a, a vet in Kununurra, Dr. Sarah Brett, who was recognising that there were a number of dogs presenting to her clinic with unusually severe clinical signs. Um, you know, we, we, we have had a number of tick-borne diseases present in Australia already, things like Babesia and Anaplasma, and they're quite prevalent through the top end. Uh, but Dr. Brett realised that the severity of the cases that she was seeing didn't match the presentations that she was used to with Babesia uh, and Anaplasma. Uh, and so fortunately, she reported that to the state authorities. Uh, there was investigation and it was soon determined that we indeed had Alicia Canis in those cases. Um, the, the, the signs which Peter's already gone through, but things like severe bleeding disorders, fever, enlarged spleens, edema, cloudy eyes and ocular changes, and of course, fatalities. So following that original detection, there was a huge amount of surveillance going on. But in fact, before the detections occurred in 2020, there had been some screening and some research going on just general surveillance to see what we had in Australia and what we didn't. And certainly the, the research over that time had concluded that ehrlichiosis caused by ehrlichia canis was not present prior to 2020 or, or at least prior to that, around that time. Um, there was a number of research groups that were looking into this, as you can see listed there, um, but really th there wasn't any ehrlichia canis evident in the, the years before these detections. And it does seem that from the clinical observations and the severity of the impacts that we're seeing in communities, that this is a recent introduction. Um, it has been determined, they've done some the whole genetic uh, sequencing on this, this organism, and it's been determined that we are likely to have the Asian strain of Ehrlichia canis. There are different strains worldwide. Um, as to how it got here, I think that will probably be a question that remains unknown. Um, it's, it's almost impossible to, to determine that, uh, but unfortunately it is here and it's probably here to stay. So following those initial detections in Kununurra, um, a, a huge amount of surveillance went on both in Western Australia and the Northern Territory. Um, a number of veterinary service providers, probably some who are on the, the webinar today, uh, were involved in that. And I think um, really they must be commended for their commitment to screening for this disease because you know, in remote Australia, veterinary services are really limited um, and, and screening for these sort of diseases does rely on veterinary sampling. So my, my hat's off to all those veterinary service providers who made that commitment in addition to the work that they normally do uh, to sample for this disease at, at no benefit to themselves, really. Um, so from June 2020 to July 2021, uh, we have had confirmed cases that have originated from Western Australia, from the Northern Territory, and also from the Northern uh, areas of South Australia and the APY lands. There's been over 500 confirmed cases by the state and territory labs, um, and it has been detected in both urban locations as well as rural and remote communities. Um, as far as that, that very distinct line that we see there in Queensland, that's obviously a bit of a question mark, isn't it? Um, there has been some surveillance efforts happening in Queensland, but I think that it is, it is likely that we will continue to spread of this disease. Um, and in fact, we have already seen some cases, uh, perhaps some of you have been aware or involved with them as well. Um, you know, cases that of dogs that have been relocated from either the Northern Territory or Western Australia, predominantly to either Perth or the Eastern Seaboard. Um, and these dogs have, have subsequently then been diagnosed with Ehrlichia canis. Um, of course, in terms of the question of whether it will spread, it, it's really dependent on the vector, the brown dog tick, as we've heard from Peter. Um, and we know that this is adaptable and that it, it does occur right through Northern Australia. Um, and we do also know that in many remote communities, due to a variety of reasons, which I'll talk about soon, that, that tick control is suboptimal. Um, we, we do know also that dog travel is extensive, particularly at the moment, I think with COVID and, and lots of people traveling within Australia. Um, we've already seen cases of those dogs being then relocated and, and bringing a canis with them. And I think we will continue to see that as well. 
So in terms of where this disease could ultimately end up, it really comes down to that brown dog tick distribution, uh, which as the same map that Peter showed, the, the map from Chandra, um, really it could be anywhere within the red regions of this map endemically. Um, and then I think sporadically we'll see cases yeah, further south of this, this region as well. In terms of how serious this disease is, I think Peter's pretty accurately and, and, and thoroughly described um, this, the severity of this disease. It really is an awful disease and it's having huge impacts on communities um, right across Australia, both in urban and remote locations. Of course, in remote communities, access to veterinary services for, for diagnosis in the first place and then access to treatment and compliance around a long antibiotic course is really limited. And so for the most part, dogs in remote communities are not being treated with antibiotics because of that lack of access to services. So what that means is that the dogs, um, they will enter the acute phase at our experience from our, the variety of veterinary service providers that we work with across remote Australia suggests that the mortality rate at that acute time, at that acute infection is between 10 and 30%, uh, which is certainly higher than what's reported internationally. Um, whether or not those cases are all exclusively alicia um, is, is probably unlikely. There's probably some comorbidities associated with that mortality rate as well. Uh, Co-infections with anaplasma or babesia, um, parvovirus even. Um, so that mortality rate may be impacted by other diseases that are occurring in those populations too. Um, but as Peter's uh, been telling us, you know, the, the disease doesn't end at that acute infection necessarily. And so particularly for those dogs that aren't being treated, that, that are likely not to be clearing this infection, at least not with antibiotics, um, it's quite possible that they'll enter a subclinical phase and then eventually progress into a terminal chronic phase. And the, the mortality rates associated with that chronic phase are exceedingly high. Um, and we are starting to see that, unfortunately, in some communities now, we suspect. Uh, what we see from a, a, a public perception point of view is, is deeply concerning um, because we see lots of sickly, emaciated dogs uh, all showing up around the same time. That's obviously an animal welfare crisis, but it's also a, a public perception problem for, for the communities. You know, this is a disease that it, what it, we didn't realise it was there. Uh, while it is preventable, unfortunately, we, we haven't had the treatments available to prevent it at at infection. And so we probably are going to see at least um, a generation, if not a couple of generations of dogs that are going to have really high mortality rates from this disease. Now, understanding the impact of this disease in remote Australia is um, it's, it's a quite a complex story and there's lots of interwoven factors that determine it. Um, you know, we work in partnership with rural and remote Indigenous communities right across Australia. And, and just as as for anywhere else, rural and remote locations and their populations of animals require regular access to veterinary services to maintain adequate health and welfare. However, geographic, socioeconomic, cultural and historic factors really impact the accessibility of animal health services for so many rural and remote Indigenous communities. And the fact is that in remote areas, which is the dark blue of this map, that vet services and animal health products are just really hard to come by. Often the nearest vet clinic is hundreds, if not thousands of kilometres away. Um, and if we take the Northern Territory, for example, there are only five regions within the Northern Territory that have permanent veterinary clinics. They're indicated by the red dots here. So that's a huge amount of country surrounding these regions where vets are not permanently available. Now it's widely accepted that there's a really close relationship between people's health and the living and working conditions which form their social environment. So beyond the genetic determinants of health, factors such as socioeconomic position, conditions of employment, housing, power and social support act together to strengthen or to undermine the health of individuals and communities. Collectively, these factors are known as the social determinants of health. And for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, the social determinants of health also include factors such as cultural identity, family, participation in cultural activities and access to trad traditional lands. Factors that are related to Indigenous community functioning are really important determinants of Indigenous health and wellbeing. Now, AMRIC's view is that social and cultural determinants of health also impact non-human family members, such as companion animals. 
Now, according to the World Health Organization, social inequalities and disadvantage are the main reasons for avoidable and unfair differences in health outcomes and life, life expectancy across different groups in society. And on average, Australians living in rural and remote areas have lower educational levels, reduced employment opportunities, overcrowded and poorly maintained housing, poorer access to and use of health services, and in turn, higher levels of disease and injury and shorter lives compared with people in metropolitan areas. What we see is that this impacts on animal health as well. Focusing just on a couple of those social determinants, the poverty rate for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples is 31%. And that poverty amongst Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people is twice as high in very remote communities at 54% as it is in major cities where the poverty rate is 24%. People living in rural and remote areas also generally have lower incomes, but have to pay higher prices for goods and services. In remote communities, the National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Health Survey found that 43% of Indigenous peoples reported to have gone without food in the previous 12 months. So improving the health status of Indigenous people in Australia is a long-standing challenge for governments in Australia, and there's been good progress in this regard, but there's still a long way to go. And so when we're talking about animal health and management, we need to factor the, 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 the social realities and the health realities of the communities into our, our views on that. People's expectations of animal health are naturally seen in relation to the realities of their own health and well-being. You know, anyone who's had even brief connections to communities cannot avoid witnessing these statistics and of, of the closing the gap story in their tragic human form. Funerals and associated sorry days occur with saddening frequency. And so it's an awful reality that animal health and welfare must be considered within the context of community health and welfare. And it's unrealistic, of course, to expect that animal health and welfare would be better than that of their human companions in any society. Now, recognising that animal health and management impacts on community health and well-being, local governments and Aboriginal organisations across remote Australia, for the most part, do try to provide access to animal health services uh, by utilising contracted visiting veterinary services or, in some case, uh, employed, employed veterinary services as well. Some regions also utilise environmental health and animal management workers to address animal population health and management concerns between veterinary visits. The resourcing for these services is, however, highly variable and often inconsistent, and this results in sporadic services with long absences of any form of animal health capacity. And so it's little wonder then that with such limited access to animal health services, combined with, combined with seasonally favourable climatic conditions, companion animals in rural and remote locations can end up with extreme parasite burdens, like the tick burdens pictured here. You know, tick burdens like this are, of course, a problem in of themselves, but combined with the threat of tick-borne diseases, obvious things that we've already had, like Babesia and Anaplasma, but now also Ehrlichia, they represent a major concern for these populations and their owners. So with all this as the foundation for the Ehrlichiosis outbreak, what's been the impact? Well, more than 12 months now since the initial detections, it's clear that Ehrlichia canis is endemic in brown dog tick populations across the NT in northern and central regions within WA and also in northern South Australia. We had a particularly wet, wet season last year and that promoted uh, ex ex extraordinary explosions of tick populations. Um, and certainly in the top end, American veterinary partners have seen acute waves of infection with prevalence estimates for Ehrlichia commonly between 70 and 100% of dogs in some communities. Mortality is reported to be as high as 30% of dogs infected. Uh, as Peter mentioned, treatment requires a 28-day antibiotic course, but in the context of remote communities with A, infrequent access to vet services, um, and, and B, issues around compliance, the treatment is, is really not very feasible in most cases. And so many dogs are going untreated. For those dogs that do survive the acute infection, we really hold grave concerns for the chronic form of the disease uh, and the animal welfare and public perception issues that I mentioned earlier. 
Of course, in these regions, animal welfare authorities are few and far between. Um, there's limited resourcing as well. And so the ability to rapidly respond to both acute and chronic cases of ehrlichiosis is, is deeply concerning and something that we continue to advocate. I really want to emphasize um, the value of companion animals to communities. You know, it's a common misconception that just because they're free roaming, that dogs in communities must be unloved and they must be unowned. But this is this is far from the truth. Despite the challenges of access to veterinary services, companion animals are integral to the fabric of remote Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities' cultures. And just as in more accessible locations, they're valued for a variety of reasons. They're trusted confidants and grounding companions. Some are culturally significant and might be incorporated into the kinship system of that community. Many are important hunting aids or protectors. And in those cold desert nights, some are also an important source of warmth. So I think it's really easy when we're talking about dog, dog populations and the impacts of diseases such as ehrlichiosis, it's easy to forget that it's individuals like this pup that make up those populations. Individuals that might be a child's confidant, that might give a family a sense of security thanks to their dog's loyal protection, or individuals that might play an important role in the community's kinship system. The suffering or death of these individuals is much more than an animal health and welfare concern. The suffering and death of these dogs and communities adds to the burden of stress and grief experienced by so many remotely. So ehrlichiosis is really not a good news story. And I'm really sorry that the, that the mood of this uh, presentation is really quite sombre, but it is the reality. And it is definitely impacting on both communities and animal health service providers who are seeing these cases at, at high levels. Um, this really is an awful disease that's, that's causing huge trauma. Um, it's really the remoteness, the, the infrequent veterinary services and suboptimal parasite control have really let this disease run like wildfire. Um, and, and we've seen huge impacts right across remote Australia. As we've already touched on, that treatment course is, is really difficult in so many remote locations. Um, and so we can really only hope that we will eventually reach some sort of endemic stability where the dogs do um, develop some sort of innate immunity and we see less severity of the clinical cases of this disease. Um, of course, there, you know, there are things that we can also do to try and prevent this disease, and that's something that AMRIC has been working very hard on. Um, Recognising, though, the, the implications for this disease on animal health, health programs is really important. Um, and, and one of the, the big things is around product selection. So traditionally, animal management programs have relied on macrocyclic lactone, so things like ivermectin or cydectin, dectamax, those sort of products, um, off-label cattle products predominantly. Um, and whilst they are excellent at preventing a wide range of parasites, they do not effectively prevent ehrlichiosis and their tick control is really quite limited. Um, so really that this disease requires us to reconsider our antiparasitic uh, programs at a, a broad community scale. And at a community scale, where we are unlikely to have success with retention of tick collars and administration of things like spot-ons can be challenging. The isoxazoline-based products, the chewables, um, that are easy to administer and can be given to a broad range of that community um, are, are most likely to suppress the tick populations and therefore lower the risk of this disease. Of course, the specific products will always need to be um, based on veterinary advice, but certainly AMRIC's been having success with things like Nexgard, Simparica, Cridilio and Brevecto. Um, and of course, that we do also though need to consider internal parasiticides in combination with those products. Uh, another factor that needs to be considered in terms of animal health programs is that ehrlichiosis through its bleeding disorders does increase the risk of peri and post-surgical complication. Um, so when we're going out and delivering dissexing programs, it's, it has always been vital, but it's even more vital now that there is judicious clinical examination of all potential surgical candidates. Um, and that, it, that if the vets have a suspicion that the, the surgical candidate might in fact have ehrlichiosis, it's probably better to hold off dissexing that animal uh, rather than trying to proceed in, in an environment where it is difficult to provide good aftercare. 
Um, in, in, in really high risk regions, it might also be warranted to consider the use of chemical contraceptives as an interim reproductive control measure. Um, hopefully, as I said, we'll reach some sort of endemic stability where we can return to surgical dissexing as our mainstay though in those high risk regions. Uh, and the other thing to consider too is that the mortalities that we're seeing with ehrlichiosis are likely to lead to population vacuums. Um, so we're probably in the next 12, 24 months going to see a rebound in reproduction to account for those vacuums and fill those voids. Um, and this, of course, then in terms of animal health programs will require an increased reproductive control effort over the coming years. Uh, and that's something that we are, are gearing up for, I guess. Um, AMRIC has developed a, a whole range of resources and these are all available for free on our website. Um, there's these posters, there's our animation, uh, we've got comms, templates and packages, you know, template newsletters, social media posts, etc. that anyone is welcome to use um, and, and we're more than happy if you've got specific questions or concerns, any feedback on the resources, we would love to, to receive that feedback. Um, we are continuing to develop educational resources as new issues around this outbreak arise. Uh, we've got a grant application in currently, for example, to try and address um, the awareness around the chronic cases of this disease and really improve people's knowledge around the severity and the serious nature of this disease. Um, in terms of the G to Z audience, one thing that I really wanted to highlight is that, you know, we, we can't rule out that this, that a dog from an endemic area won't at some stage down the track develop a lichiosis. The testing that we have available to us at the moment, and, and even probably once the SNAP tests become available down the track, we still can't rule out that that dog might be a subclinical carrier that may eventually recrudesce. Um, and become a chronic case. And so for people and groups that are rehoming dogs from endemic areas, I think it's really important to be upfront to potential owners about that risk. Um, and uh, we'll certainly provide these slides as after the presentation, but we've, we've just written up a bit of a disclaimer that you might like to use. Um, you can incorporate that into your rehoming paperwork um, that just provides some guidance to potential owners around that risk and makes them aware that you know, this is a serious disease, that the consequences of infection um, can be very grave and, and that there are considerations specific to dogs from these endemic areas that, that really should be implemented to avoid transmission of this disease down the track. Um, there's a whole lot of links here that I'm not going to go through, um, but again, we'll provide these slides. There's lots of information both on the AMRIC website and then all the different territory and state jurisdictional departments. Um, the, in terms of veterinary guidelines, the, the Northern Territory guidelines um, are excellent, and I know that Peter has contributed to those. Uh, and I also know that there's work underway to look at trying to um, develop a national veterinary guideline, probably with the involvement of the AVA. So all the vets out there, stay tuned for that one. Um, a big thank you to um, all of the partners who have contributed their experience and their knowledge to this presentation. I feel absolutely privileged to be able to advocate this cause on behalf of both them, but also the communities that they're serving. Um, this is a really serious disease. It's something that we are gonna to have to continue to deal with. We're so grateful for all of the report, the support that we have been receiving, um, both from the veterinary profession, but also um, you know, the pharmaceutical groups and so forth. Um, and a, a special thank you also to Peter for sharing his expertise and his slides on numerous occasions. Um, so I'm gonna stop sharing and I guess we open it up for questions. Thanks, Bonnie. Sorry, I'm having trouble with my buttons. That was incredible. I mean, there's just so much to consider and I'm really, really pleased that you um, addressed the human side of things because it's such a complex issue, not only medically and scientifically in the actual disease and the implications that it has, but socially as well. And I think that that's really important for us, majority of us living on the Eastern seaboard in a completely different environment and looking at things from a different perspective. So thank you. I really appreciate that insight. Um, 
some of the questions you've actually covered and, and there were a number of requests um, for the slides, um, if we're able to supply that as a, um, a separate PDF along with the recording, is that gonna be okay with you guys? Yeah, that's fine by me. Fantastic. And, and all right, that's wonderful. Thank you. Because I think there's a lot here for people to digest. And what we'd really like to do is for these webinars and their, their associated materials to be used as staff training exercises, you know, um, over a lunchtime or whatever. So um, that, that will help a lot. Thank you. Um, a question from Donna. Do you believe there is evidence that there is CME in Kaminya at this time? Is that Kaminya in Queensland, I would assume? Kaminya being um, down near Warwick? Is that where it is? I'm not sure. Feel free to... Oh, yes. Yep. See the red line on your maps. <laughs> um, I, I mean, Peter might have more to say on this. So at this stage, Queen, uh, CME ehrlichiosis or Lichia canis has not been detected in any dogs that have originated in Queensland. There have been cases of dogs that have come from endemic locations, either NP or WASA, um, that have been transported to Queensland and brought Lichia canis with them. But at this point in time, the risk in Queensland is low. Um, I would suggest that the risk is probably higher in the top end compared to the southeastern corner, and it will always be that way. Um, but it is something that we, we do expect. Elikia could travel anywhere where the brown dog tick is going to travel. Um, and so, therefore, it's something to, to just have on your radar. Mm, interesting. Donna's followed up saying Kaminya is a big greyhound area and dogs come here from NT. Yeah, well, I would suggest that if they're coming from the NT, they need some pretty good um, quarantine protocols. And they, I mean, they should be on effective tick control anyway. Um, but um, it is really critical that if they're coming from endemic areas that they are on tick control that's going to kill any ticks that do bite those dogs so that they're not going to then transmit it to other dogs as well. Mm. Yes, that's an important one. Good on you, Donna. Um, I've got a question too from Cynthia. Is there anywhere where we can donate products, etc.? Um, yeah, look, so Amrik's running a big campaign at the moment to try and support communities with access to product. Um, so we, we certainly take product donations, um, but we are able to access really great discounts thanks to pharmaceutical support. So what we generally find is that if people can su support us with um, a monetary donation, it'll have a further reach than a product itself, unless you also can manage to get discounts on your products. So um, by all means, feel free to get in touch, info at amric.org, I-N-F-O at A-M-R-R-I-C dot O-R-G um, with any sort of donations that you may have available. But we also, um, we've got a big campaign at the moment running on Facebook, which you might see, uh, which you're welcome to contribute to also. And I've just got, um, Peter's been diligently answering questions in the background, which is fantastic. Thank you, Peter. But I'm just wondering, um, just in case people aren't seeing it, I know that people have asked me about this. Is there evidence of zoonotic potential in Australia? I'll pass no, that one over to you, Peter. Okay, thanks. Uh, no, there, no, there isn't. But um, uh, you, you may know that uh, in South South America, uh, some strains of Elicocanus have been reported in people. So um, in, in a very small number of people, I think a total of five or six uh, case reports or something like that. So uh, no evidence at, at this stage. I mean, the same is true for Anaplasma platys as well. That's been reported um, again overseas only in a few people. Um, you know, in, in short, um, well, certainly there's no evidence at the moment in Australia for zoonotic transmission. It is something we're interested in and hope to be investigating in, in due course. Um, but uh, um, I think for all intents and purposes at the moment, there's, there's no evidence for that now. Okay, great. And I see that you've answered another question here about um, the kill ticks collars. Yep, they're, flu they're um, uh, a synthet synthetic pyrethroid as well and will act in the same way as Ceresto or similar, similar way. Great. Okay, so good to use those as well. Um, and there was a question about preventative use of doxycycline for mm -hmm. a community vis visit. 
Yes, I didn't. I don't know. I answered that sort of politically correctly, didn't I? Rather than than in the real world. Um, certainly, um, Dr. Cyclone has been used prophylactically in military working dogs um, in places like Afghanistan, but I guess not now. Um, but uh, uh, so, so you know, it, it is well recognised to have a prophylactic effect. Yes, but the question really is, um, you know. You know, when would you when would you use it and how would you use it and how long would you use it for and you can't use it all the time and we have to be mindful all the time of the responsibilities of antimicrobial stewardship so and and resistance will will begin to develop uh, if it's used indiscriminately so it's something that um uh, well, there's no simple answer but uh, it would be effective in short periods of time as far as um, i'm aware Mm, okay, Donna's asked the question that I wanted to ask: Is there anybody testing dingoes? Bonnie, Bonnie might be able to answer that better than me. There's certainly been a lot of concern about the potential impact of ehrlichiosis in dingoes, um, and uh, Dr. Andrea Reese was involved in in putting together documentation about what the risk um, of our wild dogs and dingoes is um, and there was a call for for any researchers who'd been working with dingoes to provide blood samples for testing but i'm not i haven't seen any data on any outcomes of that have you bonnie no i haven't either i it's really tricky you know dingoes are not commonly handled of course um so to try and get samples from them is is quite difficult um certainly there has been some testing of at least dingo hybrid dogs in who are you know living as domestic pets in communities and and those dogs are susceptible they are coming down with ehrlichia um, there has been as peter mentioned concern about the spread to dingo populations and and justifiable concern um, you know not uncommonly in communities we do see um, dingo pups like a litter found out bush while people are camping or hunting or traveling um, they'll bring that litter back to the community then and raise them up as domestic dogs what can happen is sometimes when they hit puberty or, or a bit later those dogs decide they don't want to live as a domestic dog anymore and they want to head back out bush um, and so there is a risk that if they do do that and they've been in a community that is endemic with ehrlichia um, that they could take ticks and ticks carrying ehrlichia canis back to the bush with them um, as to whether or not that would then establish I guess depends on how those dingoes are living and what sort of contact they're having with other with other dingoes you know if they're living in sheltered environments caves and that sort of thing uh, I guess it's possible that those brown dog tick populations could establish in those locations um, and potentially other dingoes that might be using those shelter um, also become infected. Mm, okay, another one to keep an eye on because I guess that's, you know, we don't have many dingo dingoes left. So another consideration for the whole, the whole problem, isn't it? We yeah. might finish it up there. Thank you so much, Bonnie and Peter. That was um, an incredibly complex topic to tackle in just one hour. <laughs> Uh, but the information that you've provided has been amazing and I know that people will be pouring over the resources for some time to come so um, thank you again for your time we really appreciate it we know that you're both incredibly busy people and um, to everyone else thanks for participating thanks for coming along um, we're aiming to keep having these events you know on a monthly basis so if you've uh, got someone that you'd like to hear from or a topic you'd like to cover please reach out let us know keep an eye on our e-news and our social media for upcoming events um, and uh, take care of yourself everybody thanks very much for coming along yeah. see you at the next one thank you very thank much. You much everyone bye, bye. bye.